so um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this is the last of our um, now conversations this semester. Um, and I am very pleased that David Edwards is here uh, with us. Um, during the summer, um, um, Sanford Quinter, who's here with us, Antoine Picon, who's, who's not here with us, is in Paris. Um, and I had the pleasure of spending some time with, uh, with David and some of his colleagues. We were in Paris for the sort of uh, finalization of all our plans with Sciences Po, and there was a conference there, and we were also very lucky to be invited to uh, the uh, Laboratoire, which, uh, which David uh, runs in Paris. Um, and had a really uh, incredible experience. I very much recommend uh, the setup in Paris. It's a really e exciting place because it's a gallery space and a restaurant and a research place. And of course, part of the fun that we had is that we also had a wonderful lunch, <laughs> which I can tell you is better than the lunch that you are, was better than the lunch that you are having today. In fact, we looked into the possibility of giving you something that a little bit resembled <coughs> what uh, David and, uh, and his colleagues would, uh, would accept uh, as, the, as the sort of standard of food, and we just couldn't afford it. So uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> apologies for the fact that you're having more sandwiches yet again. Um, anyway, um, uh, David is a biomedical scientist, um, writer and founder of the Art and Design Experimental Center, Le Laboratoire, in Paris. He teaches uh, idea development in the arts and sciences in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard. Uh, so he spends his time between Paris and Boston. And uh, <coughs> we are about to have um, the Harvard version of the laboratory, um, laboratory at Harvard, open in November. So there's actually the opening on Sunday, November 8th, I think. It's mm -hmm. in the afternoon. And I certainly recommend that. It's bound to be something very exciting. Um, I, um, we've had the, the, the opportunity to also start some um, initial phases of a collaboration together on, on that. Um, David is also the uh, inventor of new ways of treating diseases by aerosols. Uh, is the scientific founder of the for-profit company Pullmatrix and the non-profit Medicine in Need, MEND. At Le Laboratoire, he invented and launched commercially Le Vif, the uh, first product in the new field of aerosol cuisine, which he is exploring with French chef Thierry Marx. David's writing includes the founding books of Le Laboratoire, including Niche, Ecole de Beaux-Arts, 2007, WIF, that was published in 2008, and Art Science, Creativity in the Post-Google Generation, which uh, was, uh, was published in 2008. Um, in 2008, uh, David was made uh, uh, Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres uh, by the French Ministry of Culture. In the same year, he was elected to the French National Academy of Engineering, and he's a member of the American National Academy of Engineering since 2001. As per our normal format, David will make a brief presentation, about 20 minutes, and then we'll all have a chance to engage him in a discussion. So please welcome David Edwards. Th uh, th Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I don't normally give talks sitting down, but I will give this a uh, shot. <laughs> um, and as much as this can be a conversation, uh, that would be great. Uh, so uh, uh, again, thank you very much, Mosin. It's been really a delight to get to know you, and, uh, and this is my first time to be here. Um, rather than dive into uh, forks and, and whiffs, um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the context of the work uh, that I do. Uh, and uh, particularly here at Harvard, but also more generally, uh, have been developing uh, through uh, a program here at Harvard, but then also in, in Boston with the Boston Public Schools and in Paris and in uh, Pretoria, uh, a program uh, of learning through idea translation. So it's a term I um, developed a couple years ago to 
sort of explain what we, how we all live experimental lives. And so just since I use this a lot, to come back to um, the concept of idea translation, if you uh, imagine um, pretty much anything you do during your day, waking up in the morning and wishing to have a cup of coffee and uh, making some hypothesis that the coffee is in uh, the, the kitchen and there's some uh, capsule of an espresso and then testing the hypothesis and going into the kitchen and discovering there is no capsule or there is and learning something uh, and uh, possibly not being so passionate about the coffee and so giving up on the idea if you don't find the capsule or uh, being very passionate about the idea of a cup of coffee and then making another hypothesis. And so that's how we uh, lead experimental lives, how we uh, innovate finally. And um, I'm really uh, intrigued by the generality of an idea translation, whether the ultimate innovation is an industrial innovation or a cultural innovation or a social innovation. In fact, there's a really human uh, process involved. Um, so I'm interested also in idea translation as a vector of learning and sort of how we all learn from the time we were little uh, uh, babies and uh, everybody learned uh, prior to the invention of um, uh, schooling as we know it uh, today. So I'm intrigued uh, in, in what is not unfamiliar to you here given the Bauhaus uh, origins of um, the design school but is pretty foreign to uh, teaching elsewhere on campus in this sort of experiential learning uh, process where creation and education are very um, aligned. So as part of this program, the uh, laboratoire that we opened a couple years ago in Paris um, uh, involves experiments. We do experiments. There are artists and designers who are uh, dreaming and doing projects at always frontiers of science, which is the particularity of the uh, project. Um, we've done eight or so experiments so far, two here shown, one um, we opened with Fabrice Hibert, who's a French uh, plastic artist who uh, did a project um, in collaboration with Bob Langer, who I worked with at MIT, uh, looking at um, ultimately uh, the experience of a stem cell becoming a neuron. And so there were then 30 paintings and a number of installations, um, including the one you see right there, which is um, Fabrice's attempt to uh, give um, the public the experience of falling through a uh, hourglass. And so you fell through this um, uh, polymeric uh, sleeve and in the process these little white beads went up around you and you were sort of stuck in the center at some point and you needed to fight your way out and you fell out if you uh, made it at the bottom on a mattress which was his concept of cellular division. So he was, um, of course nobody did this in our ex exhibition but that was the concept. Um, we've done many other projects. One that were, uh, is related to the opening of the lab here at Harvard with Ryoji Ikeda who's a uh, really interesting digital composer in uh, Japan who did a pro in interest in math, who, who collaborated with our own Dick Gross here uh, in math on um, the concept of infinity and uh, number theory. And uh, so I totally <coughs> invite you to the opening, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so uh, at the core uh, uh, here at Harvard, we have students every fall. We teach a class where students are uh, themselves uh, dreaming, uh, uh, often uh, in uh, areas that sort of merge the arts and the sciences, and very frequently it ends up involving design. Uh, at the end of the uh, semester, we have resources here at Harvard where we can bring the students or send them anywhere in the world, and often they come to Paris where we do a workshop at the Laboratoire and help these ideas move uh, further. Um, these ideas uh, may go off in different ways, I'll, I'll describe in a moment, and, uh, but one of the uh, ways now with the opening of the lab at Harvard is that they'll be exhibited here, um, and if you, if you do come on the uh, 8th um, next Sunday, um, and Hugo uh, Van Veren, who's sitting over there, can send you an invitation if you don't have it, um, he is helping run the lab. Uh, uh, so these ideas get it. So we're interested in the concept of uh, ideas at a, in a kind of an idea funnel, uh, which is sort of uh, initially, um, and there's all these different organizations that um, we've created a kind of a family of organizations where at the top of the funnel ideas are sort of um, translating or moving, um, developing in the minds of uh, students uh, and, uh, and the value that we're sort of um, uh, extracting is an educational value. Uh, uh, sometimes these ideas then um, mature and, and we're interested in the cultural value of the process of idea development. And so the lab, the whole concept of a lab as a uh, forum for exhibition is really related to the uh, artistic um, the meaning of really uh, art as process. And so we're, we, we expose both, uh, obviously now in both laboratories, and then we have things that occasionally um, come out as exhibitions that travel um, or 
uh, companies or not-for-profits. And uh, so things that have come out of the funnel um, relate to uh, everything from uh, global health to um, a new technology, which is now exhibiting in Paris in, in collaboration with the Centre Pompidou and the Louvre and the um, uh, Musée des Arts Décoratifs and uh, the Cité des Sciences, uh, which is a new um, uh, way of exploring <coughs> culture um, through uh, uh, what we call MuseTrack, which is a handheld uh, iPhone application. Um, anyway, to get to the um, um, point of uh, my talk, uh, one of the ideas that uh, emerged from this funnel is related to the idea of eating by breathing. Uh, this is my son, actually, in the, uh, so Peter, my son, um, Rafael, who's growing up, as you can see, is in that upper picture, uh, whiffing um, on the day that we launched the product. Um, so. Whiffing uh, began as uh, two years ago. Uh, I had um, lunch at uh, Thierry Marx, a French chef uh, who runs uh, the restaurant at Cordillon Bage in Poyac, and was having lunch with him in um, the summer of 2007. And uh, uh, in the context of thinking of an experiment, um, one of the early experiments we did, which is shown in the upper um, photo there, was related to um, uh, sort of thinking of Thierry as an artist and, and uh, having him collaborate with a French scientist. And we were all having lunch together. Um, the French scientist is a colloid scientist. And so one of the areas that's really interesting in uh, uh, gastronomy today is the idea of very special kinds of colloids of flavor. And um, it started to worry me about to open the laboratoire that we would have this big uh, exhibition space with little colloids animating it. And so I wasn't sure how that would work. So given my background in aerosols, I suggested that we might think about I I breathing food. And um, uh, with the, um, that idea, brought the idea to the class and students started thinking about it. And uh, several months later, we, when we opened the exhibition, had a whiff bar that uh, Nespresso was um, sponsoring. And then it ultimately came out um, uh, commercially. I should just say that initially when we uh, um, presented the WIF a year and a half ago in this um, uh, context, we had no idea how the public, read. there was no concept of a product evolving. We were interested just in the, um, the idea of uh, um, the breathing, an act that's um, related to um, life itself, um, kind of uh, connecting with eating, which is also related to life itself, but not only not directly related. And so we were interested just how the public would react. And so it was really pretty funny in that we, um, there was a moment in the evening, the opening night, which this picture comes from, where suddenly everybody was gathered in front of the Whip Bar and we said, okay. And we had Harvard students who were sort of running back and forth from the uh, lab with filled um, chocolate uh, whiffs. And, um, and, uh, and so people found it amusing, even though everybody was coughing. Initially, it was not designed very well. And so there was, everybody was sort of embarrassed to be coughing with their first, um, like their first cigarette. And so there was sort of people were hiding that. But there was this real experience that was interesting. And so we <coughs> um, thought to bring it a step further. And we began to sell it in a shop, which is shown here, uh, where, we, where we sell uh, uh, prototypical things that are typically not working very well. And, um, and um, then for many months sort of watched what happened there. And then we came out with a product uh, last spring, which was still, uh, and I should say, in this context, it seemed that, and it seems still to me, that food and our experience with it is a really interesting uh, context for exploring uh, this idea of art as process um, and, uh, and, and, and moreover, the merger of art and science, which I believe do merge fundamentally in any creative process. Um, one of our challenges of running the laboratoire in any exhibition we do is, is having um, the exhibition be anything other than an exhibition that you would see in a museum. So how do you enter into the creative process without having uh, an aquarium uh, sort of a phenomenon? And so it seemed to us with this uh, exhibition uh, with Thierry uh, that food was a really interesting domain for us. And so we opened a food lab, which this is a picture from, uh, where we, um, we develop, we're now actively developing um, and uh, right now very focused on this er uh, area of aerosol cuisine. Um, so the first product is called the Weef. Uh, it's breathable chocolate. This is, uh, this is what it looks like right now. It, um, it came out and it received a lot more press than we uh, imagined, and we were totally not prepared for it. And so we um, ran out of whiffs uh, a few days after we launched it. And, and then uh, had it being sent all over the world and, and, and uh, 80 different countries and, and, and uh, of course people receiving the whiff and opening it in Thailand and so forth and not knowing which end goes in their mouth and so forth. And so we learned a lot about um, product development 
in the process of having it um, in people's hands um, and all over the world. And so we have really worked hard to um, come up with a new design, which will launch in the states um, in uh, in the <coughs> 2010 in the first quarter. Uh, I have some uh, illustration of it here, but it looks like this. And so it's uh, the idea here is that you uh, have uh, chocolate powder in the um, uh, in the in the capsule, and in the process of breathing, your mouth goes in the blue top part. Uh, you 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 breathe, and the air uh, flows over the powder, picks up some uh, chocolate. You in, in the new version, you can breathe as hard as you want, and there's just a certain amount that gets sort of uh, pulled off the top, and it flies up into your mouth. Now, the particle size is designed so that it can't go into your lungs, no matter how hard you inhale. Uh, although it can tickle the back of your throat, and particularly in the cur current version, but the new version will avoid that. Anyway, so we've um, designed that. So the product that we'll launch right now, uh, starting this week, the uh, the whiff. Um, so I, uh, if you come on the uh, the eighth, you'll be able to whiff. So we'll have a whiff bar, um, and and so um, uh, and we have uh, and so Jose Sanchez, which is a, who is Jose? Where are you? Jose is the president of Labo Group, which is the, the for-profit um, that we created. Uh, so the concept of the laboratoire is, is, is to have a self-sustaining uh, enterprise. So the, the, it's like the Bauhaus originally, in that we have a for-profit part that's hopefully going to make ends meet. And so Jose runs that. And so it just started to sell in the La Fée uh, Gourmet in Paris. And, uh, and so this is the design that will come out. So we're uh, exploring other ways of uh, of uh, eating uh, by breathing, and we're I hope to talk here now with Mosin about the uh, what all this means. But um, it, uh, uh, where we're this <coughs> is uh, we're breathing uh, dry uh, powder, uh, dry food in the air. Um, so just so everybody un aerosol. So if you think that until now uh, food has come in either a liquid form or a solid form. Uh, presumably also vapor form, um, uh, but also uh, now we've sort of, we're interested in a new form, which is an aerosol form, where you've got particles of powder or particles of liquid in the air and sort of suspended. And uh, what does it mean? And so you, you eat or you drink, but what do you do there? And so that's interesting to us. And we're kind of dividing it into two categories. It's um, it, one that kind of associates with, with eating and one which associates kind of with drinking. And so it's like whiffing and waffing. So WAF is this, and so it was something um, that um, uh, I developed, and then uh, uh, Marc Bretillot, who's a uh, really interesting culinary designer, basically in, in France, uh, designed this object, um, which uh, if you if you come now to Paris, you can uh, have a um, martini uh, uh, in uh, WAF. Um, it looks like that when you when you do it. So you put a glass under the. Uh, faucet basically and and the powder so the, the the so you basically have liquid you pour liquid in and uh, you turn it on and it has uh, piezoelectric crystals that create an ultrasound wave and it leads to very low pressure um, you know high and low pressure in the liquid and it leads to cavitation which creates bubbles and then droplets kind of break off and you get this kind of cloud which is then just recycled, right? And so it's just this sort of reflux. Um, so it's going up and going down, going up and down. So you have this very small particles that are about one to five microns, so they're not very gravity um, prone, but enough so that if you open the faucet, it f comes out into your glass, and then you can sip it out. And, uh, and that's waffing. So um, you can uh, waff a martini, or you can waff a tomato soup. Um, you can't waff milk, and so there's certain things you can't waff. And so we're um, exploring all of that. And uh, and uh, I you know to be more serious about what this means, um, it, you know is it eating? Is it drinking? What is it? Um, uh, there's there's also uh, just clearly um, uh, uh, a an extreme here, in that if you think about uh, eating um, as as uh, having uh, you know different uh, range of possibilities, we are at one end, um, and it is uh, I think. Uh, really interesting and provocative, and, and in a way, where we've been going uh, with food for thousands of years, if we think back to the age where we um, presumably killed an animal and, and ate it, and then for three days looked for another animal, uh, to 19th century menus that are incredibly, um, you know, these big, big meals, to what we do now, we've been moving towards smaller and smaller quantities at more regular intervals, 
And so there's this sort of asymptote that we're approaching where breathing and eating are sort of the same thing. And so that's what we've sort of pushed everyone to with whiffing and waffing is this, um, and, and which is, and what does it mean? Um, uh, it, it almost feels as if uh, it is, um, if, if at one end of the eating spectrum is uh, uh, caloric intake and, and um, uh, related to our survival, and another end is, is completely related to some very aesthetic experience that has nothing to do with our survival. We're clearly at that end, um, which raises the question of, you know, how uh, is this related to art? Um, so that's a, a really interesting question, and I, I guess um, to, um, firstly, before we even pose it um, completely, I'd like to just say that um, concretely, whiffing and waffing. Um, so if if you if you uh, if you take a whiff, um, you get uh, less than a calorie, uh, but you can actually get more than a calorie, and you can. Waff, if you waff for 10 minutes, you'd get about 200 calories if you had the right substance in there. And so you can get substance. It's not like it's not. When you normally, when you eat, obviously you chew, you do all kinds of things that are related to the enjoyment uh, as well as the, just the getting the um, food <laughs> in your digestive tract. Here, actually, it doesn't enter your digestive tract. And so when you eat, you put food in your mouth, uh, you absorb you immediately begin to have some absorption of nutrients that are solubilized through um, uh, enzymes and so forth in your mouth, and then absorb. You have your mouth is uh, vascularized, and so you absorb into your bloodstream. But mostly, you're digesting, swallowing, and it's mostly um, absorbed through the gut. And so here, we don't really ha you don't swallow. You whiff, and you don't swallow. And so there's you've you've taken away the chewing, you've taken away the swallowing, you've taken away all kinds of things that your tongue must do when you eat. And, and so what is that? Um, it's interesting, and mostly we've noticed when people whiff the first time, they laugh. So there's something surprising about it. Um, but uh, as we've been uh, 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 um, now selling whiffs for, for, for a while, uh, it's clear that um, whiffs are uh, used in, in all kinds of ways, accompanying cafe or after dinner and so forth. And so we think that whiffing and waffing, uh, apart from the questions of its uh, aesthetic um, uh, ramifications will be part of the um, sort of <laughs> culinary rep repertoire, and uh, and we're we're sort of interested in just uh, exploring that. So that's my talk, and um, I'd love to uh, talk with you more about it. <laughs> Great, thank you. So. Um, So David, my mind works much more slowly than yours. And you, you, uh, you covered a lot of stuff. Um, and I think it would be good <coughs> before we um, open it up to just go over a couple of the, the things. First, I want to understand better this term idea translation. I got the bit where you've been upstairs and you come down and you're trying to get a coffee and the coffee is not there. Uh, but I, I'd like you to sort of give me a little bit more concrete examples of what you mean by idea translation. Yeah. Some, some, I mean, like, especially in the context of maybe what you've been doing here. I think for us, this is a, th these kinds of notions are very important because we're constantly dealing with certain concepts and certain ideas, and we're also thinking about how we translate these ideas into other things. Yeah. Um, and so there, there are things that have a sort of embeddedness of ideas in them. Um, but the whole phenomenon of translation itself is, is, is interesting. So just, just, just do a little bit more on the, yeah. on the idea translation concept so and, and its relationship maybe even more broadly to the, f the phenomenon of uh, art. So that, for example, we m do we understand whiff and whiffing and waffing to be you know, part of that yep. concept of idea translation? Yep. Uh, yep. So okay. just, yeah. Great, absolutely. So, um, just to define the term better, uh, let's imagine this room is a uh, constitutes a space, uh, what I'll call an idea impact space. So every molecule in this room is an idea. And what differentiates between one idea and the next is impact. And so this space is a way of measuring impact as it relates to ideas. And so if I am the set of ideas of measure zero, the kind of impact measure zero, uh, as points, as I move points away from me, move molecules <coughs> away to, to a corner of the room, I'm 
mo translating. So this is not translation in terms of traduction. Yep. It's translation in terms of translating, moving it. Mm -hmm. I'm moving an idea towards uh, impact. And so um, what we think, uh, in, in I def sort of in my mind define this space partly to deal with issues of um, innovation, which is such an uh, overused word. And coming here to Harvard in 2001, I found it, having been uh, had more experience at MIT, very polarized in that um, there are certain things you can do here and there are certain things you can't do and uh, in terms of uh, innovation. And so I found that really interesting and so I, I searched pretty hard to find a context where nobody could sort of say I was kind of violating some rule. So the, this idea impact space was a space where everybody was and, and so uh, that's firstly what I mean by idea translation is moving an idea towards. Now, no, no, that just before, so, so let me just, so the, the, the molecules and the, and, the, and the willingness to move, let's say, something through translation. Uh, I'm also now thinking, while you're saying these things, that there is some, some, uh, some notion of the idea of translation linked to concepts of uh, imagination or new forms of creativity and things like that. So just link them. For yeah. me, so how is idea translation, for okay. example, in your terms, yeah. linked to yeah. Yeah. your acceptance or rejection or, or willingness to deal with the phenomenon of creativity, for okay. example? So the, now having just defined the term, uh, the uh, fundamentally, um, I believe we live, and, and I almost define life this way, uh, through the translation of ideas. So I began with a very trivial example of coffee. Um, I d personally feel, and I probably we all feel, that um, our willingness to get up in the morning is very much associated to our, uh, mm. our um, ability to hope uh, in the realization mm. of ideas that matter to us. And it could be a coffee, it could be something you know m m that takes all of your life to realize. Uh, so if I take uh, uh, and, and, and I'm getting to the whole concept of creativity, and I want to maybe just start uh, most in saying that, in my view, I'm much more interested in the idea of art mm -hmm. or science as process than I am as outcome. I right. think it's very uh, subjective in a way. What is art and science, really, from an outcome point of view? But it's, for me at least, a lot clearer from a process point of view, what is art and what is science. And so I I'm going to come back to the creativity and idea mm -hmm. translation just to say that in any particular idea translation, we are, um, s let's say, just to be concrete, I want to become mayor of Boston. So that's my point that I target. That's why I want to become mayor of Boston. There's no book I can get and read. There's nothing I can kind of go to a store and buy. Uh, mayor of Boston, it's, it's not obvious how to become mayor of Boston, and so it's a very hypothetical sort of process. And I may begin with a hypothesis that I need to, uh, you know, become the owner or manager um, of some, cor st you know, bar on the corner or whatever it is, and so I can become known in the neighborhood or whatever it is. And so I make this hypothesis, and I, I then, uh, it, which is a very aesthetic sort of thing. In mm -hmm. fact, the hy where does hypothesis come from? Uh, by a man I met, admire a lot, in, in, uh, who died a couple years ago, Judah Falkman, who uh, was the um, pioneer of uh, angiogenesis. Um, for 20 years or so, uh, uh, in, in, and uh, was near to getting a Nobel Prize, for 20 years or so, pursued this idea that uh, tumors grow by virtue of vascularization, which kind of helps them live. And nobody believed him. And he didn't really have data that proved it. And so here was a scientist who was kind of c basing his career on something that he couldn't prove. And so in fact, most of us, all of us, it, to the extent that we're in the experimental and particularly at frontiers of knowledge, are hypothesizing, whether we're artists or scientists or not, we're in this sort of dream mode. And so the beginning of becoming the mayor of Boston is dream that I can't be it. I take myself that seriously that I can actually, and so I actually then figure out how to become owner of this store on the corner. Uh, I then uh, go through the process, and at some point, having become owner of the store or whatever, I wake up in the middle of the night and I say, you know, I'm owner of the store, and I've kind of made friends, and I'm not even close to becoming the mayor of Boston. And so I'm depressed. I don't sleep, I'm, I'm angry, and my wife doesn't like me, and, and, and I, I then 
you know, I may give up. But typically, uh, if I'm a passionate uh, about my idea, I will, uh, you know, figure out that, you know, I need to become an alderman or whatever people become to be, uh, and so I kind of go, and so creative people and the process of creation um, involves uh, uh, hypo hypothesis and analysis, induction and deduction, uh, intuition, uh, an ability to <coughs> embrace a complex world, but also to simplify it to a definable problem. In fact, it is a fusion of two processes. One process, which is a, what I call an aesthetic process, mm -hmm. which we tend to encourage in certain families, certain environments, certain, uh, which is uh, sort of the substance of hypothesis, which is, is, is intuitive, inductive, uh, you know, comfortable uncertainty, thriving in mm -hmm. ambiguity, true, and that it's reflective of something fundamental about the human um, condition. Uh, and a process which is analytical and deductive and capable of simplifying a complex world and sort of true and that it's reproducible. And those processes, that's taught on the other, s my department, right? <laughs> and what's problematic today and the whole reason for, so creativity is fundamentally related to this fusion of an aesthetic process and, a, and an analytical process, a scientific process, an artistic process, art and science as process. It is uh, fundamentally related to how we realize our dreams. It is increasingly, and the reason why I'm so passionate about the subject, uh, hard to introduce uh, institutionally in that we're the specialization that has occurred over the last, uh, however, uh, but especially uh, since the explosion of information that exists today, is such that we have divided uh, sort of creativity out. And so I have to, by virtue of you, I come over and I'm here in a more, much more aesthetic environment than I am. But it's hard to find those environments institutionally where we're encouraged to dream, to make mistakes, to be wrong, and to analyze and deduce and, and discover. So um, that was not exactly your question, but that's just a riff off of your question. No, 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 but I think that that's very helpful. I know I, I, I want to I go to other people uh, very, very, very quickly. But no, go ahead. No, okay, go so ahead. I want to ask your question again in a different way, because I've had this question on my mind since the day I met you. Um, you did transpose, it seems to me, I'm almost sure, an idea that was practical for you in your uh, professional, and even I would say business life, somehow or other, the aerosol delivery of a drug came to find a new environment in which new questions could be asked about it, mm. et cetera, et cetera. But I know nothing about that, and I don't know if anyone here does. Yeah. What was it? What was the invention, yeah. the patent that led to this? Yes. Um, and, and just to, and I'm going to answer that, but I want to say one other thing, which is then totally you're um, putting your finger on. The, um, we all learn and, and stimulate creativity um, by changing cultures. Um, that was true from the time we were in the crib to the kitchen to the first day of school. We were in these shockingly different environments, which we were very sensitive suddenly. We were everything. We were very curious, and we, like, we, were, we were afraid. And that is Fundamentally, what creators do is they, because everything about education and life is to s is to eliminate that sort of uh, sense of risk and and to eliminate that sort of sense of uh, of that uh, adolescent spirit, and so creators tend to put bombs in their life that cr suddenly throw them out of the crib into some other, and so this invention, which was related to, uh, it was the late 90s, and, and uh, my background is applied math, and I had a, um, uh, uh, somebody, uh, I was very frustrated, but nobody cared about applied math, and, and I had a trouble getting a job. And, and uh, so I was ultimately uh, a, uh, somebody at uh, MIT sort of told me that, you know, it really matters today to try and eliminate injections for diabetes, and, and some people are thinking about aerosols. And so um, the idea was that if you look at how aerosols are delivered right now for um, asthma, for example, it's very inefficient. And so you kind of spray it, you breathe it, and a few percent or 10 percent or whatever gets into your lungs. And so for back then, thinking about eliminating injection for insulin, you needed a very reproducible and high efficiency thing. And so that was, so somebody, some group was working on a, like a shotgun kind of approach, but then it was like 
people were sort of being arrested because they had these sort of bongs that they were dealing with. So there was, how do you simplify it? So we, I, the idea was to create a particle that looked like a, a wiffle ball. Uh, and so make a particle that normally would be like a sphere, like a stone, and to fill it with air. And so it becomes big. So you have the same mass, but it's over a bigger size. And so it ended up sticking less to other things, but it had the same weight. So it's still delivered in your lungs. And so I, I invented. Oh, it's not this big. It's not that big. No, it's instead of being three microns, it's ten <laughs> microns. And so, yeah, no, it did. It's and so, um, yeah. So that was the invention. And um, so it was, a yeah. it, was a, it was an expandable. It was it was a particle. Piece of chemistry. Yeah, it was it was it was it was uh, sort of material science uh, in that you were the, the way you made these drugs, you made them uh, in a, a, a t look uh, like uh, wiffle balls basically and. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I ended up, um, but I think that the, the, what was fundamentally relevant here was I was thrown into the Côte d'Ambage being total innocent with regard to um, cuisine uh, and kind of um, naive and, and vulnerable. And, and, uh, and so I, I kind of reached you know, for the absurd to kind of um, survive. And I think that innovation is, is like that. Mm -hmm. um. I, I can follow up, but maybe uh, maybe other people want to ask something, please. Yes, uh, um, what you're talking about is uh, is uh, totally fascinating. Obviously, that's why we're all here. Can you hold the mic a little bit closer, sir? Something like this. Yeah, that's great. Um, I read recently a study that says Boston is actually the fastest-paced city in North America. So, if anyone ever feels hassled, that might be why, and that's part of my question. How do you pace and time and schedule this sort of creativity in an academic environment so that it works semester by semester? So, well, I think so. There's a there's a personal answer to that, and then there's like an institutional answer. So I think that all of us personally, and this is kind of a secret to the what I think is the answer, need to create um, sort of sandboxes uh, where we can go and play, and and I think that um, it's a Part, right, but we need to do that. Um, and part of my secret is m moving between cultures. It's when, whenever you get on the plane and go to Paris, nobody knows you're there initially, or when you come here. And when you leave, there's all kinds of stuff that's kind of attached to you, which is by virtue of you being here, but not being here. You know, so anyway, moving around helps a lot to kind of create sandboxes around you. In here, the course that I teach, which was not obvious uh, initially um, in terms of my own department, which had real, I, I, they never gave credit to my course for the first few years because it was like, well, you don't teach, cal there's no calculus, there's nothing, how can this be? But it's for, I think undergraduate students are real sandbox in that they come in and we sort of <coughs> say, well, you know, there's not going to be any test. There's not going to be really much homework. This is all about you dreaming and uh, having ideas and uh, learning to develop ideas. And uh, you know, and, and I can still remember some classes where the first class and the what if I don't have any ideas? <laughs> so well, that's <laughs> no, that's amazing uh, as, a, as a reaction. And so I think um, uh, that's part of it. Um, but I, it, that's a really profound question, and, it, and there's a lot of ways to kind of uh, uh, this, this long conversation. We have. Um you know, obviously, a, a lot of these similar issues, partly also because we work very differently. In the, a lot of the work of the school is in the context of a studio. And the setup of the studio is precisely that there are certain sort of issues. And you've got uh, 13 weeks to, to, dr to dream, in a way, about the project. So the structure of the studio is very much based on this notion that the work that we do is part of an aesthetic experience. And it's based around the ideas of dreaming. It's true that certain studios become more um, more instrumental than others. M they become more typological. They're more goal-oriented than than others. But nevertheless, I think the structure of the studio is very much based on the the notion of certain kinds of projective thinking that are actually based on on in its best form in this idea of dreaming. But I think the phenomenon of let's say. The, par the parallelism with our art as process has existed in, in the, especially in the context of architecture schools, for a long time, architecture mm -hmm. as process, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, of course, has a very rich history uh, and very productive history of things that it's produced when you say architecture as process, where you de-emphasize in some way 
the, the end goal and you uh, put the emphasis more on, on, on uh, processes that are to do with uh, certain degrees of distanciation, if you like, mm -hmm. from, uh, uh, from objective uh, goals uh, through, a pro through a process of postponement where uh, the, 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 the process is basically allowing you to uh, find alternative, alternative possibilities uh, which in some ways I think this idea of engaging with other things is, yeah. is a form of also yeah. um, distanciation. The, 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 the problem that I think uh, the history of uh, architecture as process uh, raises is that at some point uh, there, is a, there is an attempt to try and relate the process to some kind of product. Yeah. So, and you have that for example, yeah. you have a process based thing, you dream and then you end up with something called a whiff or something called a waff. Um, and um, then, then you have, uh, because of the experience, let's say, to the life of, you know, coffee drinking, you also have certain parallelisms with what might be the, the originary experience of, of that. Um, I think that's a kind of unfair thing because the process as an artistic experience has already produced something. But I think that, that always process-based work leads to a certain kind of tension mm. with the product. You can always say that only the process is the product, but there are also actually there are certain things that become an ultimate product that are in a, in a package. So that relationship between process and product would also be something interesting to hear your reflections. I can say what my thoughts are in terms of the benefits and the problems of that mm. relationship, but I think it would be good to know what you think yeah, about that about that, that relationship. That's, that's really interesting. Um, I think, and this actually gets back, I think, to the previous um, question, that the for me the secret of um, creating and, and almost uh, forcing these sandboxes and resolving this tension between process and product. Um, involves coming back to this idea of translation process and seeing the it, 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 the process is is a is a start and stop process right and so you're going from one hypothesis to the next to the next to the next to the next and uh, in a studio it's probably unfair to impose uh, 18 weeks or whatever it is on a studio and uh, and and so you're what's really interesting is to um, find a way. You'd be surprised by what we impose on people. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, anyway. Uh, anyway, so I think the, the, the goal, it seems to me, is to create an uh, organizational structure where you, um, you, you sort of validate and present to the public uh, intermediate points in the process as product. Mm -hmm. um, so the the whiff that you can whiff. In fact, I don't I don't have a yeah. So we have to actually open up the whiff here to see. The so the whiff that you whiff today is not the whiff you're going to whiff four months from now, and so nor was it the whiff that you whiffed this mm -hmm. summer. And so whiff, what is whiff? And so whiff is like moving on. And so mm -hmm. I think that there's w a need for us to find ways to. Uh, number one, engage, uh, extract product mm -hmm. value from the process. But it does, no doubt, it requires you sort of to stop and kind of put on this other mindset, mm -hmm. which is full of tr stress. Sure. So Jose, who is here, who represents Labo Group, and you know Caroline, who is the mm -hmm. director of, uh, the artistic director of the Laboratoire. You can imagine all of the um, headbutting that goes on as an idea is moving from a purely cultural sort of endpoint to a commercial endpoint, all in the same, it's a process, right? And so I am looking back and say, it's one process, but there's definitely feelings of mm -hmm. possession and of, of all kinds of stuff that goes on. So it's hard to do that, but I think that the, it's important to, it is attention. I think it needs mm -hmm. to be attention, uh, but I, I think that the resolution is just to realize that, and I think it's happening today, iPhone, it's like every six months, like a different Moments thing. Moments of closure. And, and, and so I think that in terms of the answering this question, I think that and w it's what I try and do with my class anyway, is to tell the students, you're going to get a grade at the end of this thing, but if you really dream of this, we have money to send you elsewhere and to carry your dream on. And we think you're going to keep learning after the class. And so there's this thing that happens where you sort of erase the final grade a little bit as their ultimate, and then they're going on. And, and, and at each milestone, they're, um, they get some value back, and they, but, but it's not an, 
it's over kind of thing. Great. So, uh, there, do you maybe can you wait for the for the mic, please? Thank you. A, c a cynical reading of uh, your work would be that uh, you're essentially having a trickle down between uh, discoveries made in science to the world of art, um, and that uh, and, and that they just and that, and so it's that one way street. Um, how do you see it more complex than that? Which I imagine that you do. Yeah. So we have right now 52 ideas in the idea funnel. Um, so we've talked a lot about whiffing and waffing. Um, our we one of the projects we've developed um, with uh, Shilpa Gupta, which I think was showing mm -hmm. when you were there, uh, was just bought by the uh, Museum of Modern Art, uh, Louisiana, in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. and uh, it's purely cultural. Uh, she, uh, where was the science there? It was uh, Mazarin Banerjee, who's uh, here uh, locally, and it was a, a contemporary art riff off of the concept of. Um, terror and its origin in the unconscious mind. One project um, which ended has it continues to travel around the world uh, was with uh, the photographer James Noctway um, and uh, who worked with scientists in the field um, uh, related to sort of the, uh, the war uh, against AIDS and, uh, and uh, the, our exhibition traveled to Bangkok and, and has there, there was something in the New York in the, in the Time magazine and so forth. Um, you know we have uh, uh, by virtue of the fact that I am a scientist and I'm here and, and uh, uh, I, y there would be this sort of feel to it. Um, if you look at the Bauhaus and, and, uh, and you look at what then um, was, you know, sort of, um, you all would know it better, but, metal you know, sort of certain kinds of chairs and so forth. Um, in fact, a lot happened that was completely, uh, you know, um, sort of crazy and, and uh, very, uh, had a cultural value but had no real industrial value. So I think it's fundamentally important that an organization like ours um, has purely cultural, purely humanitarian, purely s uh, educational, and purely industrial things all going on at once. And there's all kinds of conflict. And the reality is my impression is that artists, scientists, um, th they are s one day they wake up and they're humanitarian uh, sort of um, uh, innovators. One morning they wake up and they're we're complex individuals, and I think that we're all moved in, in different ways. And so I think that the, um, there, there, will, there are different threads. And we are at the Laboratoire. When we opened, with, it, was, it was pretty crazy. The first uh, year, people didn't really understand who we were. And, and this whole concept of uh, uh, whiffing and waffing, um, yes, it's important. It has, it has a pragmatic um, relationship to, ultimately, the economic survival of, uh, of the Laboratoire. But it was by no means programmed, and you can speak to <laughs> Jose. And I mean, it's it's, it's completely uh, a bet on the creative spirit more than it is a. Um, uh, so w the last thing I'll say is, if you look at the Media Lab as a very different model, where you have companies that come in and they put money in, and in return they get sort of rights to intellectual property, we would never do anything like that. And so it's a very different model where you're sort of. Um, uh, 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 betting that commercial innovations will come out. And, and so this is nothing, uh, nothing like that. Um, That's good. Yes, please. If you could wait for the mic, I think because they, they are taping, so thank you. I mean, you make a great case both in the book that you wrote and also just now that the connections between art and science, for sure, in terms of what attracts people and the process aspect of it. But just following up still on this question about the difference between outcome-oriented people and probably more aesthetically-oriented, process-oriented people, sort of in some respects, you know, the difference between a professional school, whether it's a medical school, an architecture school, engineering, and Herbert Simon made this distinction between people that are sort of more outcome-oriented. I'm just kind of curious if you think it's, are there different types of people that are attracted sometimes to puzzle solving, um, either pragmatic or whatever, or is it, is it a matter that, uh, and also different styles of solving these sorts of things, or, they f or is there more of a bridge there than sometimes there appears? I think that while we, the focus here has been on the sort of universality of uh, creativity, it's impossible to uh, deny that when you walk into the School of Engineering and Applied Science in almost any office in the School of Engineering and Applied Science or any class, you're, everything around you, the way people 
are um, is different than when you come over here to the School of Design. And, and for sure, whether this is a consequence of some dis arbitrary decision we made at some point, we ended up being made that way by the system, uh, or we had some sort of genetic um, predisposition. I think it's probably, you know, it's some combination of that. But it's clearly, there are different uh, cultural environments. And we, uh, I think, uh, I'm not a anti-specialization, uh, actually. I have my own specialization. And I think that it is hard to deny that in a world of incredible complexity, um, one way of absorbing that and getting on is a specialized. Um, so I think that there are these differences. And, and, uh, and, and they're, they're probably, uh, you know, it's necessary that a, uh, the ICA feels different, has a different communication sort of paradigm than um, if you walk into the entry of the Broad Institute, which kind of has some exhibition goal, but it's like it's a very different deal, right? It's probably, you know, there are different people who come in and they communicate in different ways. So I think that seems to me so true and integrated into how things work that I'm not really focused on that. I'm, I'm much more interested in what's been left out, which is this the fact that at some level of uh, performance in the ICA environment or the Broad Institute environment, I think that we are all the same, and, and that interests me. Involved, um, but I'm still a little bit confused about the art aspect of it. Because on the one hand, you could say that it is uh, kind of like, uh, you know, the ultimate locale treat, mm -hmm. you know, sort of really buying into this culture's obsession with weight. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, in France, where people enjoy food for the sake of food. Yeah. Um, but you do have, so... I don't know if it sort of fits into the same paradigm, but yeah. here people are going to be interested because what you know you can you can eat you can have the experience of chocolate without suffering the consequences. So that that I don't you know that obviously would sort of argue away from it. On the other hand, you could say well it sort of distills the essence of chocolate. Um, you you've referred to it as mostly recreating the. Um, the activity of eating, but so much for me at least about eating is about the texture and the, f you know, the feeling of the food in your yeah, mouth totally. and on the tongue and all of that. Mm. And if you're just breathing it, I mean, I haven't experienced it yet, and so it's probably a very freaky kind of experience <laughs> to have the sensation of chocolate yeah. without the feel of chocolate. Mm. So, um, so how is yeah, that yeah, so getting that, at the yeah. art well, aspect so of it? So just to, um, so lots of thoughts there. Uh, so the, um, Clearly, I'm interested in, in process, and so the, the, where the whiff is right now and the whole idea of people seeing it as a weight thing or whatever uh, we is, is, is um, far from uh, uh, a work of art or um, has nothing, as far as I'm concerned, to do with art. Um, the process whereby uh, whiffing um, evolved was, a uh, for me, a very aesthetic uh, process. It also definitely uh, had um, a scientific uh, process merged with it. Um, the exhibition originally was a provocation on uh, a sense that we are um, uh, familiar with. I don't think whiffing is anything. Isn't eating? It's it's not eating. It's not you know. It, it's as I say, it's whiffing, and so it's something. It's something new. And so, what is it exactly? So it's sort of provoking, and. Uh, we are now increasingly, as it's kind of going on and there's more b money being invested in it, they're clearly interested in that this thing goes out and becomes part of the repertoire of eating uh, or whiffing or whatever we want to call it, um, gastronomical sort of repertoire. Uh, the process whereby it came about was um, a process that was clearly not an industrial process. It was clearly in the sense that any company you knew or any investor I knew would ever invest in what we were doing. I had no clue. And we were not even there to sort of say, why would anybody ever whiff? We weren't. It was definitely not a scientific process in the sense that my scientific environment, and I couldn't, I couldn't sort of tell my colleagues, like, I, I'm developing the whiff, or we have a student doing a PhD thesis in the whiff. It was sort of not a category that really existed in the scientific environment. So to the extent that these concepts of science and art are fundamentally institutional concepts, it was definitely uh, <coughs> not science. It was not into, But the process, uh, in my view, was very closely related to the process whereby Fabrice Hibert created his uh, 30 paintings and, and uh, sculptures. So I'm sort of decomplexed about the outcome. And so if you come to the laboratoire, it's sometimes sort of provocative. Like, Gosh, this is not art, and uh, and uh, and uh, and that's fine with me. I think it, I'm interested in the process uh, um, uh, 
of, of creation uh, uh, and the artistic aspect of that, yes. Yeah, I appreciated your story about Judah Folkman and years ago um, I had a conversation with him about how he, some, some of the roots of his ideas on angiogenesis and it really came from his experience as a surgeon, very much rooted in real life and then mm. taking it from there, but he would be removing tumors right and left and they were bloody masses. They were just not, you know, these pristine lumps of cells. They were covered with mm. blood vessels of all, all sorts and yep. then took it from there. But nevertheless, uh, from a scientific community point of view, that was no proof, right? He had no proof. He right, had for exactly. years no proof, and all of his experiments were not really. And so when I, you know, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk, and it was a distinguished audience, and I was actually talking about these kinds of things. It was a very scientific audience, and I was talking about, well, I used Judah Fogelman's exam, and somebody stood up, and said, but he wasn't a scientist. This was two years ago, right? So he wasn't a scientist, right? He was like a medical doctor, right? And so there was, a, there was a, you just got to, so, so, so I think that. Um, but he was there very much a scientist. Oh, yeah. No, you're, you and I totally agree with that. What I'm saying is that if, uh, in a sort of caricatural way, science is reduced to the scientific method, right? Um, uh, which goes against Thomas Kuhn and a lot of thinking about how science evolves and takes big leaps by pretty aesthetic hypothetical. Uh, he was de fundamentally investing his reputation and his career in very hypothetical, um, even though he did have sort of inductive kind of proof. He didn't really have deductive proof. Well, so also, and I'll give this over, but like uh, there's a book written about the Nobel Prize winning um, geneticist Barbara McClintock entitled A Feeling for the Organism, and it's a right. deep knowing, it's an intuition, and then yes, according in yeah, the scientific method, yeah. you then have to go prove, yeah. and of course, you know, you also have to knock down preconceptions, and I think it makes total common sense sense it does. that yeah. the angiogenesis should exist. Yeah, yeah. cells need blood supply, yeah. you know, yeah, how yeah, simple yeah, and how, yeah, of course, yeah, but yeah. then, you know, it's just the institutional issues yeah. that you, you've also talked about yeah. that get in the way of that, too. Um, hi, um, my question was also about the WIF. I guess um, I had a similar kind of question in terms of how, I mean, to me, it's really obvious that the WIF takes this single dimension of eating, which is, is taste. Which I'm, I'm also I'm a kind of side question is like to what extent is whiffing basically smelling? But that's a side question. But um, <coughs> and it takes that one dimension, magnifies it, and gets rid of everything else. So in a certain sense, it's kind of I mean it's like pornography in a sense where you take one dimension of sex, find some way to concentrate that, right? And then you use that to substitute in for the whole entire kind of richness and layering of experience that you would have in the thing itself. Well, that's but a really good <laughs> fact. But, <laughs> I mean, but, but I mean like. <laughs> But then my question was then you never whiffed actually you should <laughs> <laughs> but then my question was like I mean pornography has probably its own physiological effects <laughs> too right but but it does does the whiff actually have physiological effects in the sense is it like a medicine like your medical product in the sense that it's a fork you're putting food in your mouth it's yeah very but simple. I mean like when you're when eating, you take the chocolate nutrients. you get physiological effects of chocolate yeah. Yes. Chocolate. So it's not just a taste thing. That's the thing. It's not no, just no. about. It's no, not no. just like a. No, no. Any asymptote yeah. is not uh, absolute, right? Yeah. And so you're, you're, basically, when you whiff, you have, uh, you can have 200 milligrams of chocolate in your mouth. It's like chocolate. It's in your mouth. But yeah, is so it like the way? I mean, is it's the a very fine powder. It's a fine it. powder. Yeah. It's you no. feel it. It's, you so it's so much. It, you really should whiff. It would sort of simplify everything if we just yeah. whiff. <laughs> actually. But yeah. it, it has nothing to do with pornography, but it, it, yeah. it is, it, <laughs> it does provoke, um, uh, it, but it, um, actually it's, it, it's, it, the word is sort of weird, and so it has one F, and so it, it is, you're not putting it in your nose, and so the first wave of internet reaction was that you were taking chocolate by your nose, but it's not, you're not smelling it. Um, there is, when it comes to the WAF, uh, a real, um, uh, uh, olfactory experience mm. because uh, you have a, a lot of vapor, right? This is like no vapor, and so it's it's not going in your nose. And and but with the WAF, there's a whole um, olfactory experience which is really interesting. Um, so yeah. But I guess like the way that the aerosol delivers, or the way that you know the way that the chocolate is delivered, for example, it concentrates the the taste as well as the physiological reception beyond the actual mass of chocolate that well is it's being delivered. It like it's, it's it way it disproportionate it to it it well just to, uh, your earlier comment it has nothing to do with the medical device and that it, nothing goes in your lungs right and so yeah. the medical thing was devi designed to efficiently put things in the lungs this is designed to efficiently put things in your mouth which is what you try to do with a fork right but it's a little it's more civilized 
the whiff. Um, and oh, and whiff. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so uh, you yeah. So you you breathe and it falls out in your tongue. And and uh, and uh, but um, so anyway, I, I it, it, it but I, I'm sure there's a lot of philosophical uh, ramification to it. But I think it's 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 very s it's simple. It's a new way of putting stuff in your mouth. David, that last question brought up another issue, and that was the actual ability to address uh, the neurochemical and neurotransmission system of the body. Uh, in a, like you say, maybe in a much more civilized mm. way, a uh, much more direct way. Mm. And it reminds me that in, in many ways it's the, it's very <coughs> similar to the general uh, Indian uh, uh, approach to, uh, to culinary arts, uh, which I discovered when I was in India taking some classes, you know, learning how to, that it was very related to Ayurvedic uh, philosophy, which is all about, in a certain sense, smells. They, they do see food not as directly a, a kind of a chemical digestive thing, but it's something that essentially interacts with the nervous system. Mm, and modulating the nervous system, essentially what we could say is what the, you know, what that entire world, their medical tradition mm. and their culinary tradition mm. um, are all about. They're, in, they're intimately closely linked. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's fa now, it's also true that, uh, I want to bring this thing up that you had mentioned, Bertio, uh, that that's the yeah. guy you work with. You called him a culinary designer. And in a certain sense, for us, there's a there's a there's a there's a third shoe left uh, to drop that hasn't completely dropped yet. When you talk about the kind of uh, problematic, <coughs> I say, division um, in mindsets and methods uh, that belong to the way in which thinking and, and making uh, and inventing takes place in, in let's say creative sort of milieus versus the ones that are science based and rational. But there's that word design that you brought in, very surprising to appear next to the word culinary. And I don't know if it means that he designs, he art directs the table, <laughs> programs, so, yeah. the food. Yeah, in France it's that's what he called. Yeah, so he, he's a designer and, uh, and he teaches, he's a professor of design in France, but he, he designs culinary objects and he, he does also sonography for all kinds of culinary. I mean, there's a lot of work, as you all know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, very fascinating sort of art installations that are playing with uh, senses of, of, of smell and taste that he is very involved in. So he's a designer and sonographer. Well, to, to what I want to introduce you is the possibility that, in fact, that's what design's supposed to be all about, um, connecting um, uh, thinking and making, uh, you know, in a way that is entirely its own. Now, what I'm mm. what I, what that's interesting is that the word design is starting to appear as if of necessity. I don't know what you think about that, as if of necessity to kind of resolve the problems that you're talking about. That's mm -hmm. to say, is, 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 you know, is, is, it, is it part of the new culture, mm -hmm. let's say, of thinking oh, yeah. about creativity? Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I intended before I said this that that was connected to the first idea that was just asked about the kind of channels of communication that have been opened up by a whiff waff world mm -hmm. that allows us, because we notice this already happening in speculative architecture and in speculative art, where the nervous system and its processes and its capacities, which are very opaque to us still, but we know the body can be made to respond by controlling the stimuli. And, and they're doing mm -hmm. this, a lot of artists mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. artists are doing this. They're trying to control the stimuli mm -hmm. and ask what the body can emit. Uh, today, in a completely new uh, yeah, kind of way. That's, uh, that's, there's a s hierarchy of questions, but or observations. But I just uh, let me see a couple points. I think that does, you know personally, um, I'm, I uh, I do think that design uh, and and just even almost forgetting about me personally uh, from a. Uh, Engineering, applied science point of view, there is a, and, and, and definitely more broadly industrially, there's a, a real sense of the um, centrality of design, um, uh, whereas it was not so viewed uh, that way before. Um, so I have great admiration for what you do. Um, in terms of the uh, provocation of uh, um, the senses, it's true. One of the most provocative and interesting frontiers of science today is neuro. Uh, science and neuroinformatics and, and the fact that we are suddenly going from this sort of five sense world to this kind of almost infinite sense world where we have all kinds of ways of perceiving the world 
and being perceived by the world and, and uh, that are not kind of this traditional ways. And uh, so that is uh, really, really interesting from an artistic point of view, from an a, a ethical point of view, actually. And so it's a really, really ex rich. And it is true, in fact, when the whiff came out, we frankly didn't think of it as a what would diet thing or whatever, but it got all this sort of reaction. And there's this guy who approached us, it was in like Chicago, who has this institute for like uh, weight loss and he must make a lot of money. He's a medical doctor <laughs> and he has all, done all these trials showing that if you smell or taste something before a meal, you can lower your, you know, it kind of sets off something in your head say, I'm full. And, uh, and so um, <coughs> uh, the, 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 there, was, there was a lot of uh, reaction and effort to sort of say, well, that's kind of what you're doing. And, th and we said, it really, it's not. And, and it does, um, it's interesting. But it's, it's, uh, it's um, uh, we were much more in the uh, sandbox mode in, mm. in, in the WIF than, than that. Mm. You had a question, and then we'll go here. Did you want to ask something? Yeah, yeah, please. And then afterwards, oh, you have the mic. Then you go first. So I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the implications of your um, integrative thinking uh, for childhood development, and sort of the, the notions that it changes the way we educate children yeah. right. towards uh, this new way of thinking. Yeah, I think that's you know really, and, and clearly, as as uh, Mosin was saying earlier. This goes back a long way to the early 20th century and probably beyond, beyond that. And so the, the whole role of experiential education. Um, we uh, had started an experiment last year with the Boston Public Schools. And right now are working with 200 or so Boston Public School kids who come, who are very different kids than are here at Harvard and, 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 uh, and they're younger. And uh, uh, it seems to me clear and probably to a lot of people that as much as we need to help students specialized to enter into the real world, there's a big need to create these sandboxes um, in their uh, educational experience where we can, at some point during the day or at some point during the year, say, it's good to fail. It's good not to know what you're going to be in life. It's good to play around and not even ask for there to be any outcome. That's mm -hmm. good. And that mm -hmm. may be more important to your future success than your ability to get an A on your test. Somebody's got to tell them that. And so one of the things that I find fascinating with my students here at Harvard is to bring in people who go out and change the world. And here my students are typically thinking, I've got to decide whether I'm going to be you know, going to the banking. Or and this is like the big moment in my life. I'm going to figure out who I am. And, then, and there's this thing you see with freshmen here who are really like they could do anything. And then seniors, they've decided. And so there's this great closing of the, the, you know, the American mind that happens here. And, um, and, uh, but these people come in, and you see that they reinvented themselves over and over. And they had no clue when they were 22 what they would be when they were 30 or when they were. F and it, it just keeps. And so I think creating, I think it's fundamental to provide that uh, perspective um, in the educational system, and it's difficult. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question and a comment. Um, um, about two, three, about, about a month ago, I went to the Emerging Technologies Conference at MIT, and the founder of IDEO was there. And when you were talking about this laboratory, I, is it fair to make uh, a comparison between the two of you, even though they're more on the technical side, yeah. about letting people being free well, to just I come up it, and, yeah. and just join the teams rather than having desks yep. and saying you have prescribed roles or prescribed Yep. Um, you know, you're saying you're this part in the hierarchy. It's like go join a team where you can add the most. So there's a lot of interdisciplinary people yeah. bringing their yep. strengths. Is yep. that a close? So I think that IDEO uh, creates a sort of playground environment for consulting, and so they they are a consulting firm, and so they are reacting to problems that they are, and so it's a very problem-solving organization, and so we are uh, in, we're not a consulting group, and so we have a different. Um, process and a different sort of series of values. So education is important to us and so forth. But the, it is definitely true, and there are actually many things, uh, 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 not only in industry but in education and in, in cultural um, uh, institutions today that are creating that sort of interdisciplinary environment. 
um, which is clearly a reaction to both the specialization today and the fact that if you look at the young generation and how they're living today via the internet, it's a very non-disciplinary <laughs> existence. Oh, God, yes. And they jump, and they jump, and they jump, and they jump, and they don't really care if they jump into the wrong room, right? It's like, well, I'm just jumping around. And so they have a much more um, uh, interdisciplinary view of, uh, of the world. And any of us who are involved in teaching that generation are totally confronted with it immediately. It's just this is very uh, um, fascinating <laughs> phenomenon. Also, I was sort of a joke. Personally, I happen to be an enophile, and I was thinking I got an invitation for the Boston Wine Expo. And I could imagine walking in the World Trade Center, and they have chef pairings and wines, and going there and seeing all your little whiffs and whops. Well, and and that, yeah. I think that would kill it for me, because I think there's the whole, as the, well, not with the pornography, but the sort of like the yeah. sensuality of yeah, having of the, the, the chef yeah. explain w how they prepared a meal yeah. and then looking at the, the beautiful glass, the way the glass works and the color and yeah. there's something there. Of course, there. of course. And I, I so mean, uh, and firstly, I'm by no means the, uh, you know, the, 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 the what, what, the ambassador. Uh, so the, the whiff, whiffing is a very, um, uh, very specific um, culinary experience. It is not to replace or even be thought of. I, I myself am enjoying the sandwich more. I'm not sitting here whiffing. <laughs> <laughs> and so whiffing is, is a, is so just think about how broad eating or consuming food, uh, whether it's eating and drinking or whiffing or whatever you're doing is. And so it's, this is a, this is a riff off of the, the, the culinary, and so I don't expect that people will just be sitting and whipping. Having said that, we have, by the way, been approached by wine pairing uh, companies oh interested no. to, um, <laughs> have, no. you know, you have these wine testing things, yeah. and, and, but you don't want to keep eating like a beef. And all, so <laughs> the idea of being able to whiff, you know, kind of get the flavor. See, now you're not <laughs> <laughs> right. I can see. <laughs> if I were a professional taster, yeah, if I were. Right, well, they have those kits you but can buy. But right? not for I a consumer to enjoy I, I, the experience. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a particularly practical question with no ephemeral dimensions whatsoever. Um, sorry, closer. Um, I wondered if you could say something about how it is you anticipate GSD students interacting with the work at La Lavato Le Lavatoire. Uh, my understanding from what you said earlier is you said something about having 52 projects in the funnel. I wonder if we'll be sharing the uh, funnel with that. the Parisian lab or, or love that. how it is that that'd interaction will happen. Uh, that be Thank you for the question, actually. We, um, right, we would love, and so the Idea Translation Lab we have resources from different uh, sources, um, and it's fundamentally uh, the, the the project. And so, so it's a, it's a it's it's money and, and process, um, wherein we invest in student ideas uh, that are um, typically year long based and typically involve. Um, often this interface between art and science, and uh, we I can give you more information on that. It has been focused completely on this course that I teach, and uh, we have a, a GSD student in the class right now, uh, and uh, partly because there's a lot of curation of those ideas so that they're set up in a way that is um, fundamentally risk-taking, fundamentally relevant to the world, fundamentally open-ended, and uh, where we're pushing people to kind of um, but I w think it would be totally cool and, and to find a way where clearly what you do here at the GSD is, is uh, with your studios and probably other uh, completely consistent with what we're doing to be able to bet on uh, GSD um, our students and, and have you involved would be really um, <coughs> fabulous. Uh, one, one thing, just very concretely, we have this workshop in the summer where we bring in students and, and, and uh, from Harvard. Uh, Trinity College in Dublin is involved, and the Royal College of Art is, is um, involved. We have some design uh, uh, students of Strat College and, and uh, others uh, who are involved. It would be, there's a big, it turns out our students are not design students typically, and often our, their projects have a design element. And so another way, which, which is happening right now, is if there was a way in which these projects by the end of the year, sort of the January time frame, they're always in the need of a design <laughs> Uh, we could uh, have a way of uh, um, uh, sort of inviting uh, engagement. That would be um, so th that would be very cool. I think it's also going to be interesting to see how the lab here 
becomes a sort of complement to what you're doing in Paris, and I think that also will give us. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort yeah. of like really. That's a big opportunity. Yeah, it occurs to me as I walk through the GSD that we're we're. This is the lab. <laughs> the way you you know it's it's a, but it's it's um it's um. I think it'll absolutely, and already we're, we're deeply appreciative that you actually people here are helping us a lot in terms of the That's opening right. of the uh, of the lab, which is great. So maybe you could ask uh, the last uh, question. This is more a technical question. <coughs> what is the potential <coughs> of aerosol technology uh, uh, to be delivered in a more environmental way, not so much a personal? Is is there kind of a, uh, a shared airspace that is? Uh, yeah. Um, so in fact, absolutely. Um, the uh, so the first of the WAF is getting more towards that where it's kind of this sort of communal mm -hmm. fountain yeah. kind of and and uh, and uh, for reasons of hygiene we have been discouraging the idea of everybody putting their straw into the thing and kind of whiffing or waffing um, at the same time although there's it, it is no real reason to be concerned about that you could imagine and which would be very cool to fill a room with your um, uh, uh, your um, culinary aerosol, and uh, and in the process of just walking through the room, uh, be moving from one, um, you know, uh, um, I know you don't want to do it. I'm not even <laughs> saying you would do this, but you could do this. You could imagine that. Um, you, there's issues about your clothes and all of that, but in principle, you could do that. And um, uh, but there's all, rain you know, coats. yeah, rain. Mm. But mm -hmm. yeah, but this is vapor, so there's a. Yeah. Totally. And so, but just to be clear, so there, they've, there's been a lot done in vapor, uh, vaporizing, which is a very different thing in the sense that if I uh, walk into a cloud of uh, a gin that's vaporized, I'm on the floor and uh, very quickly because it's like <laughs> it's like compl everything I'm breathing is like I'm so the the quantity it's a, it, this is a cloud versus a, uh, a gas and so it's it's and so it, but it is um, the in the air and so that's similar. But it, but in that delivery, uh, there's a very different reading of that space. One is a mechanism that you pick up and choose to partake in, and the other mechanism is one that's somewhat relinqu relinquishing yeah. your uh, free will. Yeah, that's true. Um, and so, what does that say about the work or the discourse? Or um, well, um, I think it's uh, being who I am. I guess I'm more interested in doing it than even analyzing what it means. And so, I think that the right now, what we're we're not we haven't done that. Um, I think it'd be interesting. I, it's it's not obvious, and I don't think it even my interest would be to say, well, well, then how could that be used? I think it'd be it, it's an inter interesting. Um, it, it what fascinates me with this space to get back to kind of the artistic question is that who knows what will you know? Okay, now we've got this new form, which is which is n not vapor, it's not liquid, it's not solid, it's something in between all that, and you know how will people? Uh, it, it clearly is not going to replace eating or drinking, but it it, it, it is an interesting complement. And uh, already Thierry is, uh, you know, it's it's it's, uh, it's a long conversation. But I, I so I can't really answer what the means about free will or about the work. Um, but it it uh, it um, I, I suppose is the equivalent of um, swimming in a martini in a certain sense that you um, that's also <laughs> possible. <laughs> or music or pheromone. Well. <laughs> 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 Not music like in the banality, but in terms of the control of the environment. Yeah. Well, I, again, I, it, I, I think that there's in, in, in making a steak, there's no statement about the need for you to plunge your head in the steak and kind of only breathe steak, read steak. And so I think it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, I mean, I'm sure you could, yeah, you could fill a balloon with it. And that would, and so I'm not sure what the, uh, what it says about the uh, form. It's a new form of food. Is there somebody? <laughs> we, we need to, yeah, maybe this could be a quick one. Yeah, yeah. very quick. Well, it's, it's, this is an extension of that question. As I was walking over here, I uh, walked by a, a restaurant, and the, the wrath of the, of the smell of the cooked beef was quite distinctive. You know, within a period of, say, a half a block. So there was an association with that sense experience. So I'm interested in how the sense experience has to do with the design of space, you know, particularly a little to walking through the GSD like You should you know, all think that that's like a really fascinating question. Right. You could have walls of nanoparticles falling down your head like fairy dust. 
Well, in the lower reception rather than entering the elevator. So, so <laughs> when, when we, just to be clear, when we first made the WAF, the first WAF, which was uh, very crude, uh, we did a party uh, in opening the level of twilight, and it was um, such that the, the cloud ended up going everywhere. And so there was this thing by the end of the evening where there was just this kind of haze that was around everybody. Was sort of, it was really weird. And uh, we, the design is such right now that the cloud stays in, the, and so this is not sort of sending. But it is true that there is a, a smell, and you're right that it has implications of um, a space and design, I, I guess. So I know maybe some of you want to uh, talk to David and interrupt his uh, culinary experience uh, eating this sandwich. Um, um, it's really great that you're here. I know that we will go on to um, collaborate on, on interesting things. And, uh, and I think, you know, in a way, the, the, the laboratory uh, also is, um, is, I hope, a kind of way to begin a bigger project also with the with the with the engineering i mean with the with the school of engineering because i know that cherry murray is also very interested to you know be collaborating with us more broadly um so um i'm very thank excited you. about all the Me possibilities too. so thank you so much for being here and thanks all of you for uh, for being here this afternoon thanks great thank you very much.